you may not want to run out after the talk, but you might want to run out during this talk. I just want to get you ready for that. Hi, I'm Jim Groom. Um, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, New York. I love New York City. And I'm going to talk to you today about what I'm calling the educational apocalypse. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll talk about this DS-106 MOOC that I was part of. Before that, but I want to kind of look at a couple of narratives that are dominant in our culture right now. And it didn't actually come to age with the internet. The internet, I think, just kind of augmented um, these narratives. And they're narratives I'm compelled by. And I think there's something we can graft um, very specifically on education. So what's about to follow is a presentation I've never given before consisting of 25 animated GIFs. This could be the best thing you ever saw or the worst. I take full responsibility for that. Um, and it's very, very, I have to be, it, it's completely indulgent. All my favorite movies have some sort of animated GIF in here. Um, so let's take a look. Um, <laughs> what I'm going to do is actually talk to you for a second about the two narratives that I'm going to be kind of examining. One of them is the apocalypse narrative that's going on right now. If you see that, what you basically have is the end of the world. It's all over. It's all ending, right? Um, we have the whole vision of peak oil. But I was actually pulling gifts from Road Warrior, right? And you remember Road Warrior, that scene where there's this kind of oil basin in the middle of a desert. And there's no one around but a bunch of maniacs who are like, please give us your oil. We will not kill you. Right? And then this whole kind of narrative of explosions. And I'm fascinated by this idea. And I'm fascinated by the notion of not only do we have the post-apocalyptic narrative, but we also have the zombie narrative. Right? What is interesting to me about I me, mean, I was into zombies, you know, as, as early as George Romero's kind of Dawn of the Dead. Right? You had these zombies walking into a mall because they didn't know what else to do. Because basically that's what they did in real life. So they came and they walked into a mall in this film or in the post, or in that undead life. And I was fascinated by this as a kind of critique on our culture. Why are we so fascinated with this idea of the zombie? Why are we so fascinated with this idea of the end? And what's interesting to me in some real ways is how that might map on the crisis logic surrounding education. Like the whole idea of no child left behind, right? This whole notion. That 70% of schools now are failing. And why is that? The idea is behind if one kid at one school fails, we're all failing. And there's this crisis logic. And it was the most brilliant thing that George Bush ever did. It's because by saying one kid at one school fails, we all, we all fail, you create a complete crisis. You create an emergency in education that may not exist. And I'm fascinated by this notion of crisis. And I'm fascinated by this notion of us having a gun to our head every second, whether we're teachers or students, right? There's this crazy kind of notion, right? And then the administrators, <laughs> two months, Bender. I have you for two months, <laughs> right? This is what we're up against. This is what we're dealing right now in higher ed. And we're alone. We feel alone. We have this kind of post-apocalyptic narrative. Everyone's a zombie. Maybe we're zombies, and we're alone. We don't have resources. We don't have connections. This is the narrative. And Jose Wilson did this brilliantly in his talk. He talked about how the media is vilifying these teachers. It's really horrific what we're doing to one of the greatest professions in the world. right? And I think, yeah, exactly, for all the teachers. But I am not about crisis. I think it's a scam. And we saw that with Occupy, right? We saw it with Occupy movement. They wanted us to label what is this that's happening. And we don't know. And once we label it, they can disable it. And I'm very interested in something else. I'm not going to engage the shock doctrine, right? I'm not going to give in to that. I want to think not about money, because I think the shock doctrine opens up the complete space for entrepreneurs to come in and redefine education and redefine what a teacher is, and actually deprofessionalize this space. And that's why I'm afraid of it. It doesn't mean all corporations are bad. It just means I feel better when they're not around education. Now, we need to have a talk. <laughs> Can we have a talk, please? Can we talk? What I want to actually talk about is I want to talk about not the crisis mode, but what's possible. Right? We all saw this. 
Tupac's like, what's up, Coachella? And everybody's like, oh my God, what just happened? Star Wars came to life. That little 1977 hologram that we saw of Princess Leia saying, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, became part of our culture. And for me, it's like, this is a beautiful moment. It's a mo moment where everything's possible. It's a moment where we're kind of reimagining where we do our teaching and learning. And rather than the crisis, I want to talk about unicorns and rainbows. I'm so much more unicorns and rainbows than crisis, even if they're getting pepper sprayed by that bastard at UC Davis, right? I am fascinated by this. And more seriously, just look out in the lobby of the AMMI, the American Museum of the Moving Image. That's a gift you should do, the American Museum of the Moving Image. I hope I'm their new ad campaign. Um, but more seriously, they have in the lobby a whole series of animated gifts of that Senghalese um, soccer star and how people in the visual moment were playing with the visual vernacular. And this is a perfect example of that. As soon as the UC Davis, you know, brutally pepper sprayed those kids, internet culture was on the rise and it was responding. And responding with something so brilliant as having My Little Ponies pepper sprayed by this monster. What could be more monstrous than to have him pepper spraying, not kids, not students, but My Little Ponies? Did you know, this is just a side note, and I'm not supposed to do this in a TED talk, but I don't care, but did you know there's this whole thing called bronies? Isn't that weird? It's like men who are really fetishizing my little pony things. And there's a whole community online. Why are we not teaching our students about bronies? Now, <laughs> let's talk DS-106. Can you dig it, right? When Cyrus gets up there, can you dig it, right? I am very interested in us thinking and using the web to create the visual vernacular, to be part of a community, right? And DS-106 is a digital storytelling class that is actually open. And it's all about cyber infrastructure. At the beginning of the class, I asked students to get their own domain and their own web hosting. They set up their own space, and the DS-106.us website pulls all of their work in. And what we have is we have a community of production. The whole class is dedicated towards them working through elements in visual, design, audio, video, mashup, fan fiction, and remix. And so we're actually showing them how to do it, but we're not instructing them on tools. We're actually asking them to create stuff, produce stuff, and then actually show other students in the class how they did it. We're asking them to do exactly what you see on that wall in the lobby to kind of be part of that culture, to remix it. Exactly what you see with that My Little Pony animation, right? And this is that personal cyber infrastructure, that space that they own and they produce from. Now, the class is open, which means anyone could be a part of it. And when I started DS-106 in, to make it an open class in spring 2011, I didn't know what will happen. I was afraid I was gonna throw the party that no one came to. But actually, 500 people signed up and the 25 students I had at Mary Washington in the class were interacting with the web. It was this real powerful, authentic space of learning happening, right? And what was most important about it is it was fun, right? <laughs> students were having fun. They were producing. Did I mention it was fun? People were dancing. People were having fun. And I don't mean dancing literally. They would mean animated GIFs of people dancing to show how they were excited. And this whole notion of this visual vernacular in which we communicate within, in which we have fun within, in which students are being highly creative. Now, I value the essay. I value writing. But I also value us as educators and as educational institutions getting away from the crisis mantra, getting away from gutting our educational systems, and start investing in what it means to create and produce and be a citizen of the web. I'm fascinated with it by that idea. Now, one of the things that happened in this course that I really find fascinating is the course went open. About four or 500 people signed up, and some did more than others. But about week three, the course got a radio station. Isn't that weird? Someone, Grant Potter, up in uh, British Columbia, created a radio station. Now, we didn't want to use Illuminate. We want to stay away from Blackboard and those crap tools, because we didn't want to get sucked in, right? Yeah, thank you. Yes, a good pause for that. So what we did is we created a server, or Grant Potter created a server, which was an open internet radio station. So from any iPod or Android phone or from your computer, you could actually hack in and start talking. So we'd broadcast um, the classes, but then students would start getting in and they would create audio assignments that would go on this actual radio station. And what we had was a relatively cheap 
social space through audio to not only do the assignments, but to create a kind of network. And a network of a radio that went well beyond the class. And that other students, there's actually a K-12 um, institution up in Canada that has not DS-106 radio, they call it 105 The Hive. And it's a school radio station that students are creating for. To me, that's the goal of this. Now, I don't know why I put this in. No, I do. Um, I put this in, <laughs> right? I put this in because what I want to do, my dream vision, and the Gates Foundation wasn't too happy about this, is I want to get a bus. And I want to get everybody in the bus, and I want to go cross country talking about DS-106, how we should create, how should we do this. I don't know what the smoke's all about. That's not going to be part of this bus. <laughs> now, I don't want a digital facelift. I don't want what we do online to look like that. I want us to create real, authentic spaces where students are creating, where students are thinking, where students are imagining online, right? And that's really my point. Now, you've been so patient with me, I would like to buy you all a drink. <laughs>